So Pare Architecture, uh, they will today uh, present idea uh, of uh, title of lecture is moving things in the city. The question that they want to talk about today is how can we define and expand architecture beyond buildings? In other words, that uh, architecture is more than uh, just designing building things, how building architecture is connected with spaces around it, as well with other buildings and overall with the city and ultimately with society and community. Can cities sustain themselves without constantly constructing new buildings? Aha, this is kind of degrowth thinking. How can we connect diverse communities in the context of constantly changing urban environments? So how, how, how could architecture become more dynamic, more fluid, because buildings are built out of concrete materials that often equate with static or permanency. Moving things in the city envisions the potential growth of today's cities and architecture through the eyes of various apparatus, such as personal utility vehicles, uh, PUVs, which I actually uh, self-proclaimed of that PUV, that can be docked into hilly landscapes as cities like Seoul and most of Korean cities uh, are surrounded by mountains. So a lot of uh, city, part of the city is actually built upon hills, which originally used to be informal settlements like you would see in Tijuana. Uh, but uh, since then, it has been more uh, developed. And uh, urban robots that can collect byproducts from the manufacturing industry and solar robots that can self-assemble to become shelters. Aha, uh -huh. uh, transformers, it seems. Eh? Architecture as a transformers. Through the eyes of these moving things, Pare has developed three projects. One is called Docking City, two, Looping City, and Air, bloom, air of Blooms and Inhabiting air that creates a closer relationship among things, human, and nature. So it's beyond internet of things, I am presuming here. The biography of Pare, which is an uh, acronym for Bureau of Architecture, Research, and Environment, is an architectural studio established in 2014 by Jinong Jun and Yun Hee Che. The studio, as you can see them right here, uh, on your left is Jinong Jun, on your right is uh, Yun Hee Che. The studio is committed to exploration of architectural practices through research with a focus on the production of things with life cycles that respond to the dynamically changing urban environment. Barez works include a site adaptable installations for title Specters of the State Avant Garde, which was presented in the Korean Pavilion of the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2018. Another project is a self assembling shelter for Habitat One, which was presented at Hyundai Motor Studio in Busan, which is second largest city in Korea in 2022, and a pneumatic uh, air beam pavilion for the Korea Aid for Respiratory Epidemic Mobile Clinic, clinic Module H2021 that was made during the COVID-19 crisis. Its latest work in pneumatic structures was acquired for permanent collection of the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul, South Korea in 2021. Bare was awarded the fifth Arumjigi Heritage Tomorrow Prize 2015 and was a Young Architects Program final recipient 
uh, finalist in 2016. And uh, Jinong and Yuni both are the graduate from the Architectural Association School in, in, in London, England, and have taught at the Korea National University of Arts and acted as a co-curator of the Seoul exhibition at the Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism at 2021. They are currently serving as a deputy director of the, for the inaugural exhibition of the new Korean National Museum of Urbanism and Architecture, which is a major uh, building uh, set to open in 2025. So uh, their young blossoming career reflects a lot about the growth in architecture, design, and urbanism in South Korea. So let's welcome both of them. Um, th thank you, um, Kyung, for highly extended profile and introduction. <laughs> um, hello, we are Chinong and Yuni. We would like to thank uh, Professor Kyung Park and UC San Diego for organizing this event, as well as everyone joining us online, even though we can't see you guys in person. We met Kyung in 2014, I think he was one of the one of the jury one of the juries for the Heritage uh, Tomorrow Five project, which was our first project, that, the first competition that we did, and that one when we set up our studio in 2014. So it really means uh, a lot for us to um, have this lecture organized by Kyung, and we are very happy to share our works um, since then up to the latest installation but it all started with the docking city in 2014 where Kyung was kind of our, our mentor <laughs> so let's say uh, Kyung is the person who actually uh, persuaded us to stay in Seoul rather than going back to London <laughs> yeah so let me share the screen and then show some of our uh, development and if you have a uh, program to see and let us know. Thanks for a uh, period of architecture, research, and environment in Darren short. And we think the um, architecture, people studying architecture research is a crucial uh, factor to driving force and also what's really affect afterwards to the environment. So we're trying to uh, think what's before and after through this act of uh, doing architecture. And Barry's um, architecture studio, um, especially in 2014, coming to the exploration architecture that responds to dynamic environment and times research and practice. And our work includes a site adaptable installation, a kinetic pavilion, like a uh, uh, um, um, image new Eurasian project, which we are participating, and also number of artwork for the public spaces and exhibitions, and also biennales. And most recent years, we've been developing um, pneumatic structures and pavilions that house a negative air pressure isolated to the rooms for the COVID-19 patient uh, during the pandemic. What you see here is the a series of the our installations and art interventions in public realm. And we pretty much interested in the combination between um, analog and digital combined together which enable us to uh, broaden the direct uh, contact with our bodies and movement so those are the uh, project uh, we developed the new much structures for COVID-19 patients and I think this is the far largest scale ever we 
speed and power in building scale so far. And of course, um, we are also doing accurate things and also inscription designs. Yeah, so to us, architecture is not just about buildings, but also exhibitions, pavilions, urban research, and publications. And it is pursuing any project that allows to unpack and actualize the boundaries, boundless possibilities of discipline for the better environment, for better society. So this is overview, so you've got the kind of rough idea how we developed since 2014. So, but before we jump in our project introduction, we wanted to provide a little context about how the architecture scene in Korea has evolved over the past decade or so. So in 2014, when the Korean Pavilion was awarded the Golden Lion Prize at Venice Biennale, it was kind of a booming uh, point so that a lot of um, cultural money investment uh, started in Korea. And then 2017, the first Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism started. And then like Kyung introduced in 2025, uh, we are expecting and also we are preparing the, the first National Museum of Architecture and Urbanism is set to open. So there's uh, so many, um, uh, chances and opportunities for uh, like a young uh, practitioner like us to uh, participate in these cultural uh, events. So with this ongoing expansion of architectural institutions and cultural platforms in Korea, we've been able to challenge ourselves to ask new questions regarding our cities and, and, and architectures. And also uh, through uh, teaching uh, with students, we delved into the theme of mobilities in, in, in urban uh, settings. So we look at a lot of um, areas and, and particularly looking into uh, small things, but also the larger uh, vehicles which enable us to uh, move around the world. And looking at this um, small development of the uh, gadget of electricity, and then um, homewares, and then even single rooms, how they uh, developed with, in relationship with uh, this uh, small uh, gadget around our uh, life. So we today introduced the three projects. The first one is the Docking City. And Docking City is a site in Usadanu area, which is a vernacular residential area which is the only stretch to survive the massive develop, redevelopment um, redevelopment uh, along the Han River in Seoul. So during the first three years of research, we, this is where our studio was first set up. So we were trekking up and down these steep hills and we noticed all kinds of weird personal vehicles like PUVs, personal utility vehicles, which were in use. And they were in fact serving to connect the buildings and residents in this local neighborhood. So based on these observations and some findings, we proposed a five go system. So the first one, we have the I go, uh, which can be folded. And the second one you see here is a we go. So it's a container sized station, which can store the I goes and also be used as a waiting space for transport, other transport systems and an up go uh, is specially designed escalator and which is better suited for sloped hills and stairs, stairs, but they can also contain the igos. Then we have the vertigo, which is uh, um, using the upper floors of the main street. Uh, and, the, and the last one is the a ramp called Tolbo. 
so which is a, a, like a housing complex for the users and creating a new residential uh, units for the local residents. So what we proposed was a um, flexible system of multiple scales and usages that can work with the existing urban conditions rather than a single best solution. This work re-examines a loose web of relationships and networks through a physical proposal and explores the viability of actually enacting such a solution locally. So for the proposals, we selected five sites, five actual sites of certain characteristics that are best described as site and suggest a range of programs. So for example, this one, because this is a kind of foreign district, there is an Islamic mosque and a couple of churches. So it was kind of shows a really diverse range of uh, local residents, but also these kind of religious facilities, which is very rare to see um, in one space in Korea. And then, for example, um, because the because it's on a hilly roofscape, so hilly landscape, so it's got amazing um, roof views. So we're trying to kind of find um, a way that can actually you know, accommodate um, the existing characteristics and can provide facilities for the, for the local residents. The second project is, uh, and, then, and then so we did uh, like an exhibition at the end of the Dokkin City Research Project. And this is the actual one-to-one IGO -one that we made. Um, then the second project um, that I want to share today is the is the Looping City, which is a project in Ujiro. It's uh, um, if you visit Seoul, then Seun Sangha is like a one kilometer mega structure that was built in 1968 by a Korean architect called Kim Sugun, and it has a, a like a sprawling market complex with. Uh, a huge uh, mega structure, but it's also got a small scale manufacturing industries all around it. But at the moment is currently facing demolition for new developments. So this project imagines uh, a new circular economy, which is based on recycling networks using byproducts, which are disposed of during each stage of production. And in this area, you have uh, um, all these uh, like electrical lighting and metalworks and these printing industries that are currently um, currently available. So you can see it in the middle. There's the the huge mega structure. It's a concrete mega structure from the sixties, and all around it you have these uh, small low rising manufacturing um, areas. And these are the kind of uh, wastes or leftovers that you get from these uh, manufacturing industries. But because these are very small scale, um, like one man shops, all these uh, wastes are kind of thrown away. So our concept was uh, finding um, kind of a, a self uh, moving robot, which can roam around these areas and collect these wastes from the local shops. Because here already there are these kind of vehicles that are in use, like the docking city. So we proposed like a three system. So you have this uh, tubo and you have a tubo station where the tubos um, send these waste through pneumatic tubes. And you have docking space where these uh, recycled products are uh, resorted and they're made and turned into um, filaments for plastic or filaments for metal so so at the at the beginning we kind of had we didn't really have much budget so we had a um we just kind of made a uh a, a movie from the point of view of a tuber so to, to, as if a tuber was kind of wandering around these streets and then finding these things which are usually thrown away but can actually when they are collected they can actually have some meaning and be turned into some into new material and then just to, in order to create this kind of story we made these kind of videos and um which was shown for the first Seoul Biennale uh, so this was a kind of a concept concept video. But what was really amazing is that after 
kind of making this video for the Biennale, we had uh, more funding from the local kind of association um, and some research funding. So we were able to make a, a real prototype, which you can see the you know, see this thing. So the idea of kind of imagining this project was uh, kind of adding, adding a new layer of infrastructure that can act as a, a new circular, circulatory system for the complex which is facing demolition. So it's a, so at the time when we were doing the research, a lot of discussions were about what is the real assets or what are the real values of this area. So by kind of proposing this kind of system, you can you can see the city in a from completely different point of view because you are seeing it from not from top down but actually from what's happening in the street and what's happening in reality. So this kind of um, really simple, um, just a sketch was our beginning. So we had like a tube and how it can be connected to a bigger infrastructure. And then, so based on this kind of uh, um, idea, we created this kind of uh, um, scenarios. And then this was uh, turned into a series of uh, artworks or a series of uh, um, uh, kind of drawings and proposals. So at the beginning, we only had these three drawings and a concept video. This was what the first Biennale uh, of our work, what, what it looked like. And then through this uh, um, Biennale, during this Biennale period, we also conducted a series of workshops with uh, university students. So they kind of became almost like human tubers and wandered around these areas and they found these um, wastes that are just kind of, you know, thrown away in some in corner street. And then they were try they kind of mapped where they found it and what um, they were used for. And so we also had this kind of uh, participatory uh, kind of postcards and a small bag, which we gave out during the Biennale. So actually like these, uh, for example, um, as someone who's uh, working in the metal kind of uh, um, CNC cutting industries, he actually um, returned these postcards with uh, where, what sort of work they do. So we were able to visit him for the next exhibition, which happened like two years later. So for the second exhibition, we made this prototype, actual, um, a very, very rough prototype that was just 3D printed with like an RC car body. So we were kind of making this uh, um, uh, documentary and of um, visiting the the person who actually um, submitted the postcard, the real person who actually lives and works in the in the neighborhood, and we were able to create, uh, we were able to kind of develop this project through a number of uh, exhibitions, and then the, we had also had another development, like a third series of this uh, Looping City project in 2020, where we were able to make a real one-to-one. I guess this is the first prototype, a real prototype of a, a tubo. But this time, because it's not going on the um, Ujiro streets, it's going on the Seon Sangha, so on the pedestrian network. So in order to interact with the people, we had to make it, we had to scale it up a bit and then create um, some sort of intelligence so it can actually sort to the, it can sort to the materials, whether it's paper, cans, or plastic. So this is what it looked like. And then this was also presented in another exhibition, um, like, like these two. So the Igos from Docking City and the Chubo in 2022 actually really helped us kind of um, communicate our ideas and our kind of um, research into this local neighborhood with a, a wider audience. So, and also, and also we had a kind of a lot of discussions about from, for each exhibitions, why architects were making these kind of robots. And I think these robots actually helped us rediscover the boundaries of networks of relationships that are not necessarily visible on the human map. 
So by the improvising the wheels throughout the Usadano or the in industrial these sort of robots in Uchiro, we were look we were able to look into the traces which were kind of less so obvious networks of movement which are native to each area and in order to in a way uh, really catch possible applications for this sort of uh, um, new system that can actually work with the existing urban structures so these were kind of uh, our way of uncovering these are hidden values of the existing industries and communities and actually act as a catalyst to foster a much needed new perspectives on an aging city so when we made these kind of these two robots, the iGhost, the PUVs, and the in the tubo, we actually went back to the site and and tried to put into use as to how this could actually work in the actual site. So this uh, iGo um, was actually iGo like it actually means like um, iGo, but also means like iGo in where the like lots of in Korean words it means you know I go like lots of grannies actually use that you use, use that word so we we're saying it's a, a very simple device that even grannies can write and the second one the tubo was uh, because in this uh, Seon Sangha area um, there are there has been lots of new entrepreneurs and coffee shops um, on this uh, pedestrian net pedestrian pathway so we made this uh, tubo that can actually um so they can actually detect whether through the thickness whether it's paper or is a uh, plastic and so we were actually kind of using these to go back to as a way of intervening like a very small intervention to the actual actual site so since then as you can see we're pretty much interested in um this um uh, robots and then we finally came up with um, the small modular robot unit size that called Airy. The Airy contains the energy within it. And this is um, can assign the operator shelter by gathering and disposing using hydrogen and electric charging station that will soon be found worldwide as operating post. Of course, this is a commission from Hyundai Motors. So we're expecting their uh, future vision and within this scenario. So unlike the general construction method, starting from the ground up, this approach suggests assembling mid-air, then installing on the ground. So we're trying to imagine a different approach of in, uh, making a building. So rather than from bottom up and top down, so opening the possibility of the reaching rough terrain and inaccessible area, the modular robot unit control the indoor environment by self determining the external environment and contracting or expanding air barrier with insulation effect. So those um, are scenarios so in mind, we developed a series of the animations. So the first one you see is the air of blooms call and expecting um, in 2045 they will be the first generation of the uh, carbon neutral uh, air can be you know happen so we imagine in urban setting there's always the lack of the public spaces and then why don't we uh, create the, the public spaces or public tree like when they need it. So space can be uh, created when there's a um, uh, demand. So it doesn't have to be stay all the time. So let's say this is a time-based approach rather than space-driven approach so that we can um, design the time and the space can happen when they need it only. And this is how the airy and air of bloom installed on, on exhibition space. And this size of about um, 
uh, 50 meter long and 6 meters high. And you can see in between the trees and benches, there's a uh, one airy robot actually looming around the following the white lane. So that sort of kind of trying to address this mobility between a tree and bench. Um, and of course, um, um, there is a self-sustained um, energy as a solar panel is a crucial uh, factor for uh, carbon neutral error in order to um, move certain things you need always need the energy but rather than uh, getting energy from far away or heavy uh, infrastructures um, using this uh, solar panel can uh, help you to get the power as much as you need and this is uh, existing space so they we are I try to experiment with uh, the quality of um, air volume with uh, this uh, media screen as well. So let's say the previous one is uh, a suitable uh, scenario for urban settings, and second one is uh, more about the uh, natural condition where the uh, not so many infrastructures. Uh, it's around you. So th this time, Ari act as a, a drone like, so it can fly. Uh, we imagine the uh, Ari is a smart uh, brick, and then it can also self assemble and then change the configuration according to the demand of these users and inhabitants. It can be sometimes uh, um, for humans or sometimes for you know other inhabitants such as uh, you know animals. So this idea was uh, rather than creating a heavy infrastructure in these kind in these kind of natural settings, we can almost in a way borrow the space or borrow the borrow the place for a certain use and then when it's not used it can actually be you know um, it can fly away to these uh, new hydrogen stations that the Hyundai Motor is trying to build everywhere instead of petrol stations. Yeah so even though uh, the shape or the form of the shelter looks like an igloo which is optimized for this um, installations and, and other uh, indoor uh, parameters but the whole the form can be changed uh, as we imagine can be a uh, shrink uh, can be larger and and can have uh, like umbrella shape uh, by changing the aggregation of each unit so this is how it look like um, from inside and exhibition space uh, here, what you can actually experience in it is that by changing, or let's say the breathing of this air cushion can, you know, sometimes act as uh, good for insulation at night, but uh, and uh, during the day, it can be a uh, shrink and then create a certain a uh, gap between the units so they have a uh, natural ventilation but also the space allowed to accommodate these solar panels appear. So during the day, uh, daytime, when sun's out, the solar panels are up. And at night, when these uh, solar panels goes back to this module and then air cushion is expanded and act as insulation, which is a bit, you know, against the cold. So even though we have a huge um, um, imaginations at, at, the, at the first of this project uh, stage, um, each uh, actualization phase, we try one or two um, uh, tests. And after the show, we, we are also preparing another iteration of this project, which is uh, by traveling 
uh, different site condition, whether it's the urban settings and natural settings in, in real life, how this area can uh, adapt this um, outdoor environment. So um, looking forward to uh, what's coming next. And by having said that, maybe you can stop here and then and thank you very much for your attention and listening. Yeah. Okay, uh, really amazing uh, set of uh, exciting new uh, projects that are quite experimental. Um, I want to open up the, some questions to the people in the audience. Uh, does anybody have some questions about their particular projects? Yeah. All right, hello. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. I, I was absolutely enamored with every sort of you know, fun aspect that you were going through. Um, but I was actually wondering about the funding that you received. And I was wondering how big of a role did your visuals play in receiving that funding? Because I think you had fantastic visuals. 100%. I think, <laughs> I think without any visuals, it was very hard to communicate our ideas, especially um, with the people not necessarily familiar with the you know, architecture or design field. So especially because we are working in a very specific local conditions. So the local kind of association, like, which is made up of, you know, like merchants, uh, like the shopkeepers and, you know, like people who don't necessarily um, understand this kind of ideas. It was really important that we had to have many, many visuals and trying to see how this one thing is a, a part of a larger infrastructure and how it actually is really um, based on, you know, our sur surroundings. But yeah, I mean, these, so a lot of times we had to work with a, a lot of a medium, not just one. So for some people, you know, like a, a photographic image is much more powerful, but for some others, you know, that kind of a, a video or storytelling was really crucial. So we had to kind of provide a, a lot because we were dealing with a, a very um, uncertain, um, you know, or wide ranging audiences. And also, um, as, as, as you know, like a culture, industry or the, the public money doesn't always have a, a enough budget so like we said you know every single opportunities you try one or two uh within this limited budget but um you always look for you know another opportunity to develop further with a, a small amount of budget but um that's how we uh, develop the our the first uh, let's say uh, five or eight years appear, and then the, the kind of the last uh, uh, exhibition which we showed in Hyundai with the motors is the first time. This is our first time to get a uh, private fund uh, from the company, which is uh, of course uh, different, you know, a budget scale. Let's say. Okay, so you, they explained how that uh, different audiences. Uh, requires different forms of visual in order to communicate with them about the, their issues and problems, and also to kind of get them into uh, more to participate in their project by understanding about their ideas and their work. And I think the animation also is very helpful because for uh, people who are not experts, right, uh, designers, animations are very helpful to, you know, to uh, let's say, Absolutely, yeah. yeah, to for the general, let's say, citizens to understand potentials and become more fun and more imaginative, and also that in Korea, most of the funding really comes from the government. Uh, it's almost complete opposite from United States. U.S. is more from the private sector, industries or foundations. Uh, however, the Korean government uh, is a significant funders in culture and especially technologies uh, today. And many uh, foreigners come to Korea uh, because there is significant funding for technology and information uh, uh, areas. Uh, as he mentioned that Hyundai Motor also provided a very large funding for 
this last project uh, they did, which you saw some of the pictures at the end, they're not actually 3D rendering, they're actually physically built object because a lot of times you get kind of confused whether it's real or not, uh, but that is real, yeah. Um, another question? Of course, you always have a question, right? It's more just a base question, so to speak, but like where you say that the name is like borough in it, does that imply that like it's related to the government in some way more, or is that just sort of a fun name that you decided for like with not with no specific significance to that noun? Yeah, so I think when we first uh, were trying to come up with a name for our studio, we didn't, we were kind of had many options of uh, architects, uh, studio, office, but we didn't really want to fit within the kind of conventional um, name, I guess, naming. So we didn't want to be just architects. So that's why I think we were trying to like look for um, an a word or like um, a word that actually um, is beyond within and beyond the kind of architectural um, professional professional um, limit. So bureau kind of seemed like a place. To, bureau, bureau. I mean, had like two meanings. Obviously, like bureau as like the kind of you know like a, in French word the French cabinet, that kind of desk which you really like, which we also really liked, but it also has the, you know, like big grand bureau of like a federal bureau kind of um, a place. So we kind of wanted to have those dual meanings, which we liked. And we also thought the bureau was a, a very kind of a, a, a good alternative to the conventional offices or architects. And I think we are happy with it so far. <laughs> and And for some reason, you know, for the except the Hyundai Motor Studio, most of our funding actually came all from the public, like international or national, regional. They were all public funding, so I think Bureau kind of um, was a, a good choice. Uh, more questions? Um, okay, then I I ask a question. Um, uh, many people might say that uh, you're not. Uh, they ask about where is the architecture, right? That uh, that's a stupid question that I get all the time too. Uh, and uh, so, how do you ex explain uh, the advantage of uh, the work that you're doing? Uh, that maybe perhaps expanding the field of architecture and design. Well, in a sense, the let's say. We want to address the uh, thinking process is the uh, essential in 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 a, in a production of architecture. So, in traditional sense, as an architect as trained as a draw or drawing, so like uh, as a draftman, so like uh, as uh, Alberti in seventeenth century also um, addressed the kind of uh, the issue: who is the architect and what's their job. And still, the tradition is uh, following contemporary society as well. So, architect is is not necessarily uh, as a builder; he is a, a drawer. So, on the other hand, how we interpret is the thinking is the um, uh, the essence of the is the um, what architecture we can call. So. Uh, in this sense, we 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 only to uh, spend our first uh, decade, let's say, as a, as a young uh, young uh, practitioner, we want to develop our uh, thinkings. So we thought the uh, ground for us would be uh, suitable to uh, to 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 you know uh, doing. A lot of exhibitions and writings and teaching it would be you know, nurturous to to develop a certain thinking what we like and we are, we, what we are interested in. Because um, as a students, uh, you always uh, you know always searching for new and searching for history is is always you have to learn something. Of course, after graduation, you have to learn something from society. 
But this is how we uh, spend our uh, past 10 decades or so to learn society, what they uh, require and what this society is looking for from um, uh, from architect and what architect can do. And so I guess um, this kind of question is we always been asked from our friend and also other uh, 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 expertise. But we always answer that um, uh, we we developing architectural thinking, and then hopefully in 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 few years time or uh, before our death, we would like to also address the thinking through a building. So building is uh, our uh, kind of final goal. Building is uh, one of our uh, medium to communicate our architectural thinking. So whether it's a small uh, scale of the furniture, or it's a small scale of intervention for the urban settings, or um, shelters in, in in pavilions within exhibitions and cultural settings, so the scale is uh, doesn't matter for us. The art, and and you know what I'm getting to. So the building is not the our the end over as an architect. The building is one of the medium to communicate of our uh, thinking. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think uh, what their work is about, uh, there are several things that are very important and different uh, in how they practice architecture than in the traditional way is one is mobility. Uh, they design things that move, uh, uh, that's one. And architecture don't move, you know. It just sits in one place. So there's a huge difference in terms of how architecture that can move would have to develop with different forms and shapes and scales to interact and to serve uh, people, right? Second thing is that they're working in architecture as a pieces or elements, not as a complete whole like this building. So they would take this space separate from this space, other space, in, in fact, quite small pieces that are uh, you, that you can assemble into different shapes. So it's very transformative, uh, very adaptable. Uh, and also, in many cases, uh, they are really designed for one-to-one -one human scale use and purposes. Uh, uh, so that's kind of different. And the third thing is they work outside of the building often. Uh, it's not about designing something in which that we actually are uh, inside of architecture, but they're designing architecture that is can be used outside in many different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, sightless. In other words, the buildings have sight. It sits in one place, right? But their architecture moves around and has uh, multiple sites or actually can be in any site. So these are some of the things that I uh, kind of picked up from their lecture. Uh, I hope that's okay. Well, anyway, um, uh, thank you very much for, uh, this is our final and this was a, was a great lecture and uh, uh, have a, a nice rest of the quarter week. Uh, have a good summer. <laughs>